Good afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Ron Busby. I'm the president and CEO of the U.S. Black Chambers, Inc., headquartered here in Washington, D.C. We began over 13 years ago with just six chambers. Today, we represent over 150 Black chambers around the country, located in 42 states with a membership base of over 300,000 Black-owned businesses. And when you talk to those businesses, all of them have one general concern. They wanna know how to grow their businesses, how to increase the opportunities and how to also gain the access to capital that they need to further their mission and as well as their vision. One of the things that we have been truly embraced with was around three concepts, intentionality, transparency, and accountability. When we talk to both corporate America as well as the public sector, those are the things that we're bringing to the conversation. And when we do, they come back with two concerns. Ron, we do more business with black businesses if we could find them and if we had the size and scale. So this afternoon, we wanna to talk to you about a couple of different opportunities to be able to grow your business as well as to be able to have your business found. Historically, it has been about minority programs. All of the programs that have been cre cre created to move our businesses forward have been painted under the broad brush of minority. Historically, we have seen that it has been white women have benefited the biggest in reference to minority programs. They take over 70% of the contracts that are being awarded from the federal government. And we want to make sure that black businesses can be found, can be contracted with, as well as be supported. And so I encourage all of you that are participating this afternoon to make sure that you're being certified as well. Each morning when I wake up, I'm black, and each evening when I go to bed, I'm black. And so I want to make sure that black businesses, as well as corporate America, as well as the private sector, can find me under the intentionality of being a black-owned business. BYBLACK.us is where you start. Thank you so much. Make sure you onboard your firm. Make sure you're taking advantage of the resources, the information, and the opportunities to move your business forward to be found as well as support other black owned businesses across the country. Thank you. Hello and welcome to part three of contracts and capital certifications, the door to the bag. On behalf of our president, Ron Busby, our board, chambers and our staff, thank you for attending. I am Tiffany Mays Ahelor, outreach specialist with the US Black Chambers Incorporated, affectionately known as the national voice of Black businesses. We represent over 140 Black chambers of commerce and small businesses across the nation and are founded on five pillars of service, advocacy, access to capital, contracting, entrepreneurial training, and chamber development. This series was crafted in collaboration with our chambers of commerce, providing technical assistance and resources to businesses across the US with the US Small Business Administration Community Navigator Program. Thank you for your assistance in developing and sharing this program. Today, we welcome a panel discussion with four certification experts and business owners to explore the benefits of business credentials, ways to market business certifications, and available support throughout the certification process. Our team at USBC, as well as our 20 navigator chambers, look forward to being a resource to you and your business as you navigate through this journey. Before we introduce today's moderator, I encourage you to drop your questions into the chat and we will address as many as possible at the end of today's webinar. Today's moderator is Camille Carter. She is a business and economics management graduate of Michigan State University, known advocate of business and financial literacy, strategic thinker, and progressive leader. As president and CEO of the Madison Black Chamber of Commerce, Ms. Carter spearheads economic advancement, ushers organizational development, and nurtures entrepreneurial greatness for Black-owned businesses throughout Madison and Dane County. Ms. Carter's business expertise spans 20 years of entrepreneurship, banking, and business expansion as far as Togo, West Africa. 
a pansophical individual whose guidance has graced operations like the Madison Metropolitan Chapter of the Lynx Incorporated, Madison 365, Wisconsin's 2018 Black Power List, Money Smart Women, and the Madison Money Conferences, Ms. Carter is also a recipient of the Charles Hamilton Houston's Difference Maker, Madison Network of Black Professionals Network, and Madison College Business Advisory Council Awards. Ms. Camille Carter, it is a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much, Tiffany, for your introduction. It's a pleasure to be here today. I am very excited to introduce this very diverse panel of highly qualified individuals. I'd like to introduce our first panelist, and that is Ms. Alicia Gay. Alicia Gay has the reputation for being multifaceted self-starter with knowledge in supplier diversity, project management, marketing, and management consulting. She brings value to the Buy Black platform powered by the USBC as the Vice President of External Affairs and by spearheading the certification program, stakeholder engagement, user experience, and customer service and marketing for the at US Black Chambers and at by Black US social media channels. Working in the small business private sector for six years, Ms. Alicia has developed a wide range of, of skill sets and aptitude for supporting marketing and outreach, community relations, strategic partnerships, and social media management and business development. A proud graduate of Hampton University, she is fueled by her passion for social injustice, public policy, and uplifting minority communities. Thank you so much, Ms. Gay, and welcome. Our next panelist is a West Oakland native and a proud embracer of Oakland's Black history and promising future. I introduce to you Ms. Ernestine Nettles. Mrs. Nettles is the Assistant Contract Compliance Officer for the City of Oakland's Department of Workforce and Employment Standards. Ms. Nettles is a longtime advocate of the African American Chamber and recalls its inception, particularly for the garden parties that the United African American business owners, uh, I'm sorry, particularly the garden parties that united African American business owners and their communities. As a long patron of locally owned businesses and as the assistant contract compliance officer, Ms. Nettles is well acquainted in the community where she certifies small businesses throughout the city. Ms. Nettles also encourages young professionals and the formerly incarcerated to become business owners to build a vibrant, productive Black business community. Ms. Nettles, I welcome you to the panel. Our next panelist is Ms. Sandra Barrett. Ms. Barrett has over 13 years of experience with the U.S. Small Business Administration, where she serves as the director of the Office of Certification and Eligibility in the 8A Business Development Program. Ms. Barrett's expertise is often leveraged in implementing the SBA's mission to counsel and protect the interests of small businesses, preserve free competitive enterprise and strengthen our nation's economy. Before joining the SBA, uh, Sandra served as the supervisory business opportunity specialist for the Was uh, Washington Metropolitan District Office, coaching small businesses toward government, federal and municipal opportunities, matchmaking and 8A portfolio management. Ms. Barrett, I welcome you to the panel. Our next panelist is Mr. Jimmy Reed. Mr. Jimmy Reed brings 20 plus years of entrepreneurial experience 
strategic advising, international trade and investments with the Livingston Group and as a partner for the EIGC Holdings and Assistant Secretary of Commerce of Trade and Commerce or and Commonwealth of Virginia, where he has facilitated Virginia's Year of the Entrepreneur Program. Mr. Ree received his appointment as Special Secretary of the Governor's Office of Small, Minority, and Women Business Affairs from Maryland's Governor, Larry Hogan, in January of 2015. Secretary Ree advises the Governor on policy matters related to small, minority, women, and veteran-owned businesses and monitors the state's three socioeconomic programs the Small Business Reserve, SBR, affectionately know we gotta, we gotta love our acronyms here. We're dealing with government agencies. So SBR, which is the Small Business Reserve, the Minority Business Enterprise, affectionately known as MBE, and the Veteran-Owned Small Business Enterprise, which is VSBE which is the procurement programs across 70 agencies. Throughout his career, Mr. Ree has advocated for minority businesses in service within the statewide initiatives, governor appointed advisory boards, and also in his leadership of global technology systems and mentorship to host uh, and, and mentorship to a host of small businesses and memberships, and he serves as memberships on copious boards. He possesses a dual master in science and business administration from John Hopkins University and a bachelor of science from the University of Maryland. Mr. Reed, thank you so much for being a part of our panel today. Our final panelist, Miss Alicia Gay, or Green, I apologize. Miss Alicia Green. Miss Green has been a part of the Supplier Diversity Initiative team with the National LGBT Chamber of Commerce for five years. As a Supplier Diversity Director, Alicia assists the LGBT business owners with getting their businesses certified with the NGLCC. Once certified, she works with LGBTBEs to take full advantage of their certification by connecting them to business and growth opportunities. Alicia is also co-lead for the NGLCC's mentorship program and Communities of Color Initiative. COC, another acronym. She also received her BS in government emphasis in legal studies from Texas Women's University. Before the, NL, uh, before the NGLCC team, Alicia worked for the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists or affectionately known as the CBTU, where she advocated for social and economic justice. Again, welcome Ms. Green to our panel. Today we are honored and we are pleased to have you here today. I look forward to our roundtable discussion and thank you so much for sharing and imparting your words of wisdom to our panel or to our audience. So, now we're gonna get into the details of why everyone is here. Our first question, and this is a question for the panel. Can you share the benefits of certification and how it can help firms make an impact on their bottom line? So we'll go ahead and we can start with um, whoever would like to, to take on that question first, but this is a question to the panel share the benefits of how certifications can impact a firm's bottom line. I'll okay, go. I'll, I'll, 
Go ahead, Ms. Nettles. I, I, I said, good morning, everyone, and um, to my distinguished uh, panelists. I'm happy to be here today. Uh, for me, for the city of Oakland and certification, the certification officer is the person you love to hate and hate to love because what we do is we give you the requirements for the program, which is the documentation that needs to be in place in order to get certified. And if you follow the, the list of documentation, you maintain that list of documentation, you keep it updated, you are ready to go anywhere and, and have a portfolio of your business opportunities. What the documentation for certification does, like in most programs, is it helps you to develop that portfolio of what you'll need for doors to be open. You'll have your bank statements, you'll have your insurance, you'll have um, your city license requirements, you'll have the, the requirements for employees within your business and your industry. So when you come to us, and you want to be certified, and we give you that list of documentation that is needed. Once you provide that documentation to us, you can then use that documentation to go anywhere because now you are in essence developing a portfolio of your goods and or services to work with other com companies and to appear, prepare for certification or business opportunities with other entities. I may chime in. Um, I agree with everything Ms. Nettles just stated. I mean, I have highest respect for what City of Oakland does. I remember reading their uh, medical cannabis having a two separate application process, one for the equity applicants and one for the irregular applicants. And I thought that was like transformative, something that I had suggested to our own legislators. So my hats off to what you do, Ms. Nettles. Um, now, why does certification add to the bottom line? Well, number one, if you look at the uh, uh, small businesses, especially minority owned businesses, right? There's an issue of connecting capacity, their capacity and their capability to opportunities, right? Uh, that's a primary reason why we have the social economic programs called MBE, Minority Business Enterprise, or SBA's 8A programs and so on. So look, the money that we use to administer these procurement programs called government contracting is really not a government money. It's your money, it's your tax money, okay? With which we are recirculating to do economic development. So with that certification, you have a special access to the pool of money called social economic program. That's huge. We have 620,000 entities registered as small businesses in Maryland. This is according to SBA stat, right? We only have 7,500 MBEs that are certified. That means you are one of the 7,500 rather than one of 600,000 plus, okay? With that access to that pool of money. So, it would add to the bottom lines. I'll, I'll jump in if I may. I, again, third, um, what my counterparts have also shared, but also when we speak about minority diversity certifications, um, I think that they allow for your small business to grow. It helps set your company apart from the marketplace. It adds established credibility when pursuing contracting opportunities. And even if you go a step further, it also means that you're getting increased access to set aside government contracting opportunities, with, uh, which is what uh, Secretary Ree was just mentioning. It's going to afford you the ability to subcontract on large projects um, within this federal space. This also means you're eligible for mentor-protege programs um, and also helps aid into your eligibility for assistance and financial assistance or with any of your fiduciary programs. Um, when we speak about certifications being the door, um, you in today's climate, when you are in the contracting and procurement space, you must have a certification. It is a mandatory requirement uh, for you to get access to a lot of the opportunities that are coming from the federal or private stake sector. If I can chime in. Oh. 
Go on. Thank you. If I can chime in, I do agree with what all of my counterparts were saying. Um, the 8 program right now is hot. It's on the news. It's everywhere. And it's like everyone was saying there's a pot of money that's there. But if there's three things that I can say are challenges, one for us and for the 8 program that I see most of the time with counseling and doing outreach is companies not being fully, not fully understanding what the program is about and what the program can do. Jumping in too early and not doing your research. We know it's only nine years. Nine years can go fast so quickly. And most of the time I get phone calls saying, hey, Sandra, can I get three more years back? And normally I say, well, I don't work for Congress. So let me know when you get to Congress so they can change the date, <laughs> give you more time. Uh, the second one, I think um, Ms. Nettle kind of hit on, and everyone, proper documentations. Get your proper documentations together. Make sure that they are ready because when you come in and you're submitting, we're looking at that. We're returning the application. And before that, I will put in putting your dream team together for individuals. It doesn't mean that these, com that these individuals or companies have to work for you. But one example that I can say is do not use your spouse as your accountant if they know nothing about accounting, those kind of things and those resources. Make sure you get that team together. And when you get your documentations, fully understanding the program, I believe you're ready to go. That's what ADA has to chime in for today. That is awesome information. It, what I'm understanding is that preparedness is key. We've got a narrow window of opportunity and you really want to maximize your dream team and have everyone aligned. Once you have your documents ready and, and it, it's ready to go, really our businesses need to be prepared to take advantage of these opportunities. And again, leverage the money that is set aside via the government. So our tax dollars are really helping to help us to grow as businesses. So it's essential. And thank you for, for that. Um, Miss Alicia, uh, can you tell us and the Pam and the audience today, what's really significant about launching a black owned certification program? Um, in 2020, this was an initiative that you took on with the um, US Black Chamber of Commerce. And why is that minority certification program important and available? Absolutely. Uh, again, hi everyone. My name is Alicia Gay, VP of External Affairs at Buy Black, powered by US Black Chambers, Inc. Uh, we are a digital solution, a people-centric platform that's really focused on connecting Black businesses to capital, customers, and, com and community. Um, we are a national directory and offer the only Black-owned certification um, for businesses that is off also offered at no cost. And with Buy Black, our goal is to build the best tool to find and support Black-owned businesses and to be able to foster relationships with our corporate partners, with government entities, uh, would have you to really increase corporate spend, strengthen corporate supply chains, and by enabling Black enterprises to grow and thrive. And so the reason why that's so important is that after all the racial and social injustice that came um, unveiled in 2020, it really proved to us that many people want to buy Black, and that's B-U-Y uh, Black. Um, and in our local communities, we've all experienced a degree of difficulty trying to find that Black nail salon, ladies, a Black hair stylist, a printing company, a plumber, a dog groomer, event coordinator, electrician, contractor, you name it. Um, and our market research also revealed that 73% of our corporations and governments also had issues diversifying their supply chains with Black firms. And so that it's not a conversation of the will or budget to purchase or um, patronize with Black businesses. It's um, procurement offers often struggle to find the qualification of a Black enterprise that meets and exceeds their needs. So um, if this is your first introduction, um, I want to just spend a moment talking about exactly what that means. So um, as you may know, in the world of government and corporate procurement, Black businesses are considered minority owned. Um, and this is a comma umbrella-like term that really describes a broad population of racial and identity-based groups, uh, such as women, Asian Pacific Islander, Hispanics, veterans, LGBTQIA communities, et cetera, um, all of which have nationally recognized certification programs. So as Buy Black and USBC, as we developed this platform in a conversation of equity and equality, um, we believe that is important that we not only 
you know, we don't sacrifice uh, specificity um, at the expense of inclusivity. Um, so until Buy Black uh, formed and launched back in September of last year, there was no such program for Black owned businesses. And so our accreditation uh, grants companies that hold the Buy Black certification access to participate in exclusive contracting, mentorship, and training opportunities funded by the USBC corporate partners and our supporters. Um, and again, this is the initiative first of its kind that is solely focused on certification for black owned businesses. So if you're tuning in from a computer, just take a second, um, upload in a separate browser in a separate tab, enter usblackchambers.org forward slash certification um, to find out how you can first list your business on our directory, get certified all again at no cost um, and uh, allow USBC to be a service to you and your small business needs. Such a resource and an excellent platform for really helping opportunities find our businesses, correct? It is a way in which um, to unbundle that, that big umbrella of minority and really drill down to the specificity of black owned businesses and their particular skill sets. And it's one focal point that will allow, um, you know, buyers and suppliers to really identify the skill sets that many of our black owned businesses have. So I really do look forward to this by Black certification evolving over time and many businesses taking advantage of the Black-owned certification because um, it's really time to you know, focus in on Black-owned businesses and not just minority-owned businesses. Thank you for that. Are there any additional questions from the, the panelists before I go on to the, um, to the next question? I, I would just like to add that for most Black of us who, or I just like to add that for most of us who are on this panel, I think that our consciousness, and we, we lead by example. And I know for myself and a lot of my colleagues, it is we make a conscious decision to, to search for Black and minority businesses to patronize in our individual areas. Here in California, we have Proposition 209, so we don't have set-asides unless there's been a disparity uh, study. We show the impact and then we're allowed to create a program. But at the federal level, you do have set of sites for minority businesses and of course, black owned businesses. And I encourage everyone to please take advantage of that. I would agree. Thank you so much, Ms. Nettles. Um, since we're we're on this topic, and um, Ms. Nettles, you really talked about the earlier in our presentation the importance of of having your documents ready and why that's really important. And we know that for our businesses, many times they're sole proprietors or they're very small operations, and capacity can be a challenge for them. And so, you know, in the certification process, um, many of them find that document gathering can be quite cumbersome and oftentimes an obstacle for them to get certified. Can you, um, Lynn, and then also other panelists as well, chime in as appropriate from their corners, um, what are some of the ways that organizations uh, and small business owners can help to streamline the process of gathering their documents and being ready for uh, certifications? Well, I know here in Oakland, under the leadership of um, our, our Black Chamber President, Kathy Adams, she has, uh, our Oakland Chamber, has workshops throughout the year to help you to get ready for certification and any other endeavors that you may have. Um, I know that we're currently working on putting together a workshop where we will bring together the accountants, we will bring together the CPAs, which is the two major functions in a small business to have those financial documents in place. And like I said, with certification, keep your business license updated. And uh, Kathy has done an outstanding job and our Black Chamber has done an out 
standing job with partnering with the other multi-chambers throughout the Bay Area, including the Metropolitan Chamber, to provide the list of the documentations that is needed to take your business to the next level. And I know along with our Department of uh, Workplace and Employment Standards, under the direction of our interim director, uh, Mary Mayberry, those plans are being put in place to roll that out this fall, if not the first of the year, where there will be hands-on workshops where you can come and the documentation you, are, you will need, we are telling you where to go and get it, how to keep it updated. And we're asking that when you come to the workshop, you have this documentation. The other thing that we find is that a lot of our companies need assistance with uploading documents. As long as the computer world has been around, we still have a lot of business owners who have no clue what to do in terms of this, the technology that's available to them. Because now the technology has developed to the point where you can actually hit a button and have what you need. So we're looking at bringing in those with that expertise so that our, our businesses will have hands-on experience on how to do it. And I'd like to say this, even though you own the business, and you may not be the person who does the administrative work, you at least need to have the knowledge of the administrative work and how it should be done. So that's what I would say in, in response to your question. Thank you. I know that um, many of our local chambers really serve and provide technical assistance to aid many of our businesses to really get ready and to, you know, a lot of times the dollars are in the details, right? I've, I've said this many times and it's work that no one really likes to do, but in order to advance, that's really where you have to pay most focus and attention. Are there any additional questions from panelists that would like to talk about um, the importance of gathering documentation and paperwork? Um, yes, I would like to chime in. So um, I'm Alicia Green with the National LGBT Chamber of Commerce. And, you know, our certification program, we actually have a team that will go step by step with you. But I like how you mentioned um, about having local chambers. We also have um, about 70 affiliate chambers in each state that will also provide access and assistance with the with the application process. But with the NGLCC and the other third party certifying bodies, we are all looking for a way that they have one database to really go to. If you are you know, women owned, if you're black owned, minority owned, that you only have to submit one time instead of in all of our different databases. Um, but we do have a fast track program that if you are certified with another um, certifying body um, organization, that you do not have to download all of those documents you previously downloaded because we trust their process and our process is all the same. So it provides more opportunity for businesses to be um, dual certified or whatever certification you fit into, um, you are able to get certified um, quicker and be um, have more opportunities available to you because it's all about the access. So I also wanted to bring in that, you know, I, I saw a question that somebody asked which one should we, you know, what, what, what certification should we go for first? Of course, do your research um, and see which one will benefit your business, you know, more. And then you can always get certified, you know, with other certifications. So I just wanted to put in that. If I may add, um, Scott, I, I agree with everything that Ms. Green and uh, Ms. Nero stated. The importance of documentation is obvious, right? Because the relationship between you and the government, there has to be some uh, intermediary medium with which you can vet each other and communicate, right? Now, but I think from the 
a larger perspective, we do live in the 21st century and uh, we call this age a fourth industrial age, right? And yet we are pushing paper still, right? right? And if we and we are running a social economic program to lift up small and minority businesses, and yet we put burden on them to produce documentations that's as high as you know what, right? So I think there's a, a room for technology from the holistic point of view to simplify the paperwork. You know, every individual has some interaction with some agency at some point in their lives as a person or as a business, Department of Labor, Comptrollers, Department of Tax and Assessment, they have, they have know something about you, okay? Why can we get those documents electronically in the application so there's no submission of physical paper except for few that don't exist, right? That makes it a lot easier for us to verify also decompressing the time for the uh, certification as well as the uh, documentation verification. So those are kind of things we can do, okay? Because I do believe it's all about intentionality. If you want to improve something, we can certainly do it. Absolutely. And if I, if I may just jump in here uh, from the perspective of USBC and Buy Black, as we are the newest uh, certification um, for uh, black owned businesses, uh, we knew that our solution must address some of the unique obstacles and barriers and stresses and hardships that we're all talking about here. And so, I mean, if you're looking through the lens of a minority owned business, the first and foremost is what we are hearing and the most prominent bearer is not only just cost, uh, but it's um, the de degree of difficulty in sometimes um, getting documentation that explicitly say Negro, if you, again, speaking from um, a, a black owned business perspective or black, such as birth certificates or death certificates, ancestry trees, uh, which we know that are often hard to come by. And if you are a newer, I'm talking millennial Gen Z uh, business, you're not gonna have those documents. We stopped printing that a long time ago here in the mm -hmm. US. Um, so at Buy Black, we recognize that there are different ways to verify blackness if you will, that's even a word, um, and allow applicants to you know, provide other types of documentation that can attest to your identity, such as um, a diplomas from an HBCU, memberships in black social groups, professional groups, sorority, fraternities, et cetera. And that is not a mandatory step, but more of an elective step that really helps boost confidence. Um, we talked about, uh, which we didn't really talk about, which is approval time. Um, and it's different from every certifying agency, but with USBC and our network, we are uh, using automated tools um, and building relationships uh, with secretaries of state, with departments, uh, business departments, and we're able to find inconsistencies and help fast track approval, even through our internal processes. Um, we're happy to deliver acceptance within 30 to 45 business days, when we know sometimes in the national average, especially with COVID can be anywhere from 60 to 90, sometimes more days. And so as we think about ways um, to reduce those barriers, we also have that convenience, um, which by Black, we're proud to be a completely seamless virtual experience all the way down to our virtual site visit interview um, to help in that new age of doing business. Absolutely. It really is about working together, leveraging technology to help our businesses be successful. Um, oftentimes when the process is so long, you know, we, we lose interest. And I've talked with many businesses that have been in the process and they just, they abandon the process and uh, it's unfortunate. And I do believe that in today's age of technology, we can really leverage uh, working together better to help our businesses obtain these certifications and, and you know, just really overhaul uh, the system and shorten the process for them. So thank you so much for your comments. Um, let's shift the conversation a little bit and talk about the 8A certification. And maybe Ms. Barrett, you can uh, start, you know, this conversation, but, the SBA's 8A program is viewed as the business development program that helps to escalate participating firms to the next level, really actually to multi-million dollar status. Can you explain the key program components supporting the elements and what's needed by firms to ensure 
that they are receiving the full benefits to succeed. And I know you talked a little bit about this earlier, but please uh, expand on the 8A certification program for our audience. Sure, no problem. I, I tell everybody hands down is the best program in SBA, not because I'm leading part of it, but it truly is. Um, uh, in 2020, I believe 2020, 2021, around that, we did maybe about $42 billion in 8A, and that falls under the small disadvantage, which is the percentage of um, the government contracting. And it's amazing. Our numbers for the scorecards actually are coming out today. So I'm excited to see where we are so far. But again, everybody knows created in 1978, socially and economically disadvantaged program for Blacks, Asians, um, Native American, Alaskan owned. And the, the program itself has the requirements of is for nine years and it has two levels. One is developmental, it's the first four years and the next five years considered to be transitional. Um, we, we slate it that way because we're saying you're coming in and knowing your industry and trying to figure out where you should step in and how to actually work with government. By your fifth, sixth year, you should already know that you're competing against Lockheed Martin or Verizon or AT&T saying that I've learned all the things that I need into the ADA program to stay. So what do we do when you get in? Basically, you have a business opportunity specialist, and that is your coach, your guidance. I say your counselor, your preacher, because I'm telling you, I've been a counselor, a marriage counselor, any kind of counselor you can think of. We know any and everything about you. You know, I tell them when you come to the 8A program, you cannot hide anything from us because any and everything that happens to you, we know. And why? Because it's a federally funded gut program that's for your tax money. And you're kind of getting it's reciprocal. That money back is going in a circle. What you put in, you're getting back in contracts. So that's why. And also you get 7J training, which provides you with uh, classes for accountant, maybe um, cybersecurity, administrative management, um, coaching, how to do any and everything with your company. And now we just added a component called B Bit Speed that actually, when you sign up to, it produces uh, opportunities that are coming out so you can see every month. So now you don't even have to do the work. As soon as you sign up, it tells you what contracts are coming out in your industry. We have the mentor protege program that used to be one A day and one used to also be small. We merged that about maybe two years ago, but now it's just one. It's one program that you're finding mentors um, that were currently in the A day program, which we normally would recommend. Get somebody that's gotten their feet wet, that already knows, that can help you and can target with those, those industries that you want to go into and how you want to assist government. We also have finally is assisting to contracting. Now, the one misconception that we has, I do not find you contracts. I really don't. I can recommend you for contracts, but that is if you have everything in order, meaning your yearly annual review. So I can see where you are, what you have done, what you haven't done, and kind of coach you in between where, where you are and maybe you should take a step back your capability statement doesn't look good or, or you went to this agency and the agency rejected you. Those are the kind of conversations we have with our 8A firms. If you do all that, I think you will be good. Now, in my division, I always tell everybody that I'm the good and the bad cop. I get you into the program, but I can also take you out. <laughs> Most people don't like that. So I wanna make sure that you're in compliance and you follow the regulations of what not to do while you're in the 8A program. And as you all know, we're constantly in the news about what's happening with the contracting in the AA program. But if you follow all those steps, I think you'll be very successful. Thank you so much, Ms. Barrett. You, we don't want to get on the bad cops no. uh, <laughs> side of things. And thank you so much for um, putting a really bright light on the AA program. As we come to uh, really getting into the um, Q&A session of the panel, I want to make sure that one, I get some understanding of, and, and this is to the panel at large, um, two, two takeaways that I really want to make sure that we cover. Um, if you can lend maybe two areas, two blind spots that possibly, um, you know, prohibit businesses and what actually um, delays the processing time for the actual certification process. And so blind spots, pitfalls, just common errors that we see that, that stop that process. And then I like to kind of look at, you know, if in fact we 
do everything right. And we go through the, the certification process in a very um, pristine way. What can be an actual game changer for our firms that what's on the opposite end? What, you know, what is it that's going to make it worth their while for their business that will help them to actually uh, make, you know, what is it that they will experience, I should ask. So what are two areas that they should watch out for? But if they do overcome those, what's the game changer for their business and what can they expect? Um, I'm in. Uh, I, I, I think the two important areas, I'd like to add one more. And I think there are three areas of focus that every minority business must adhere to and make sure that they possess this. And we call this three pillars of success, right? One is the, uh, the company's corporate competency. Are you good at what you do? Okay. Because if you're not good at what you do, you're going to compete in price. And that's a miserable place to be because there's always somebody cheaper than you are. Okay. And just as water seeks the lowest ground, smart contracting officer seeks the lowest value, okay, price. So be good, be differentiated, and uh, that competency is number one. Second thing is access to capital issue. You have it resolved, okay? If I ask you, you have money, and you respond to me, I'm trying to get a loan, or well, that's an X to you. That means you don't have that issue resolved, okay? Money to business is like blood to your body, without which you cannot sustain what you do, no matter how good you are. Access to capital issue has to be addressed. And number three is this government contracting landscape is complex, complicated. You have to study it and understand it, right? So you have to have some insightful understanding of what this is all about so that you can position your business so that there's a tailwind behind you pushing you forward rather than having that headwind against you because you don't really understand what all these terminologies mean when the pipeline gets published and all those little things, okay? So competency, capital, and understanding of the policies, those are three things that you must absolutely have and you rest your business plan on top of them. You miss one or two, success, success probability is lower, okay? So that's what I like to emphasize. Awesome, thank you, Secretary Ree. How about suggestions from any of the other panelists? Um, if I can chime in, I will bucket what Secretary Reese said into what is called potential for success for the AA program. All that falls under their access to capital, um, knowing your industry, what government buys, what government doesn't buy, doing your research. All that encompassed one word, potential for success. Potential for success is one of the biggest pitfalls that I see every day in the 8 program where firms are not ready. They haven't been in business for two years. They've been in business for a couple of months, but financially, they're not suitable. They're not ready because government does ask for your financial statements. And then if they do need it, they come to SBA and we do what is called a certificate of competency saying, are you responsible? Meaning, do you have the capital to perform if government does not pay you in time or to continue all that work? Or can you even pay your employees? Because if not, the Department of Labor is coming after you. If you get those things together with potential for success, that's the biggest key while we are declining companies coming to the program, that bucket of sole source 8 a contracts where an agency can directly give it to you. They don't have to look at anybody else. They don't have to go left or go right, right in the middle, find you, and you can get it done and you know what you're doing. You can get up to $4.5 million. We're trying to increase it. So just wait for that. <laughs> but the sole source will be right in your bucket if you do that and you listen to having that potential for success and learning federal government. It's not the same. It's not the same as private commercial or state government at all. It's a different ball game. I, I definitely hear you. Game changer, right? Yes. Game changer. And I, I just wanted to step in because um, I, I agree 100% with what you both are saying. And it is really about just being realistic with what type of service you can provide, um, whether it's government or with a corporation. Um, and, you know, just research the certifying body first and, you know, just decide who you want to work with and what you can actually obtain and you know um, what your business can do. And these certifications are not only for federal contracting or corporate contracting, this opens up access to your other peers, to your other suppliers to do that tiered contracting. So you can also look into that as well. 
Awesome. And These then chime me. in. And then chi oh, cool. Go ahead. Who is that? I was saying to uh, chime in uh, to, um, okay. if, let's say you're not ready for the federal procurement space and you are new in business, you are trying to get some degree of past performance um, and you're looking to use certification as your way of helping you be more marketable. Um, a couple of things that come to me in mind um, and I am speaking to everyone, whether you are seasoned or not, let's be sure that you are beginning with the end in mind and preparation is key. I think we're all saying that, right? Uh, be sure that you are not only know what you're getting yourself into, but know what is required of you to not only get it, but sustain the certification mm -hmm. um, or you know, 8A program. Um, also be sure that when you're providing your documents, make sure that they're fully executed. Make sure that all T's are crossed, I's are dotted, where there is a signature, make sure there is a site signature, it is dated, it's notarized. Um, I cannot tell you how many times we have to request for um, completed versions of um, documentation because the details um, are necessary, they're important. Um, and then also, uh, Ms. Nettles, you mentioned it earlier, but ensure that you are in good standing, um, depending on if you are at a state and local, they may uh, refer to that as clean hands with your state and um, taxation departments, make sure that you are also filing on behalf of your business um, and in staying up to date in your corporate licenses, your business licenses and registrations or what have you um, to make sure that you're not in a position where you are almost at the finish line and do not meet the requirements because of something um, as simple as not renewing. Um, so please keep that into account as well. Uh, Ms. Carter, I, if I may just add to that there are a lot of small businesses, minority-owned businesses that said, I understand access to capital, but the banks are not giving me money, right? What should I do, right? So I totally understand that. I think we, this is something that we need to resolve from the holistic point of view, right? With the competency and insightful understanding of policies, that's something you can control. You can learn and become good at it. A access to capital is to totally, it's a wholly different matter because Money likes fast return and no risk, right? That's the nature of the market, right? So if the government is willing to spend uh, gobs of money on basic researches such as SBIR, STTR, and so on, because these are kind of areas where corporations don't want to waste their money. It's too risky, right? They want to just commercialize the ideas rather than do a basic research. So government understands the importance of this, so they put money in there and incentivize the space. Now we all talk about how important the small businesses are, okay? But we do not invest in small businesses, meaning we don't have a risk capital for some of these competent small businesses that are out there. What good does it do to give somebody a contract if that person, as Deborah Kelly just stated, I can't get bonding for it, okay? There's a disconnect in what we do, all right? So that we need to have a holistic rethink in this space and until we do that, we have to stop saying small businesses are the backbone of our U.S. economy, all right? Well, so what? What are we doing to uplift them? We're not doing much. A lot of our policies, because not because we are bad people, but we preach Christ, but we practice corporate, all right? They don't match, right? So there are a lot of areas that we really need to rethink. So this kind of discussion is very important. It is very important. And if we don't, if you don't understand where those, again, blind spots are, that the system and the infrastructure is not in place for forward advancement, then all of this, these efforts, you know, go for naught. And so thank you for that. There's, there's a lot of work that, that we have. Um, I want to get into Q&A, but Ms. Nettles, you have your hand up um, just quickly so that we can get some of the questions from the audience answered. Okay, the one thing I wanted to say is that I work at the local level, and at the local level, our small businesses don't pay attention to the policies, and it's the policies, I agree with the secretary, policies have to be changed, and they have to be updated, they yeah. have to be reviewed in the process. For instance, here in Oakland, we're looking for companies that are headquartered in Oakland, and or 20% of your staff of the work is done here in Oakland, or in Oakland. That's a local policy that would not apply nationally. However, when you come in with this criteria and we have to look at 
do we do we maintain a policy of headquartered in Oakland and small businesses not be able to expand to outer areas because if you're not headquartered in Oakland, then you don't get the opportunities to be certified in Oakland. If you're not headquartered in San Francisco, you don't get the opportunity to be certified in San Francisco. And we've got to look at our policies and review what can be done so that small business has an opportunity within every geographical area. And mm -hmm. small businesses have to be taught, you're going to compete against other companies. And when you're not, when you're not successful at that bid, you need to ask for a step-by-step -step review as to why I was not awarded that contract or I did not receive that bid. We don't do the follow-up after the fact is one of the things I see, and we don't know the policy. That is excellent, excellent information. We don't do the follow-up. A lot of times we, we take a big L, we get in our emotions and get in our feelings. And sometimes it's really about business. It is about the details. It is about filling out the information. It understanding that we are dealing with government. It does, policy does not change easily and quickly. But on the other end, this opportunity, if you are successful and get to the end, and can understand and, and, and abide by all of the twists and turns that this can be a game changer for your business. But let's... And my, my last point is we work within the different systems, but business, small business has to learn to become its own advocate. Mm -hmm. we, we're inside, but if they don't bring up the point and they don't become their own advocate, in many ways, our hands can be tired, tied. So they have to learn to become the advocate. We were talking about when this program started in 1976, I think it was. Those were small business people who became advocates and got into, got the 8A programs, the certification programs, the state's programs. So businesses under, have to understand you're going to have to do a little more. You're going to have to speak up for yourself and you're going to have to become the advocate for a small your small business. Excellent. Excellent point. <clears throat> and again, I can't even stress to you that's what as small chambers of commerce advocacy is a big pillar of the work that we do because we know that if you are not at the table you are on the menu and it all happens at the policy level and at the local levels. And if, you know, and so I'll, I'll leave it at that. But one of our, our questions here from uh, the audience is for small businesses, what would you recommend? You know, there's so many places to get started, but for the best certification, where should a small business start? I will start, we have in Maryland, this is unique to Maryland. We have two uh, major programs concerning minority businesses. One is MBE, that's uh, Minority Business Enterprise based on gender and race, right? And, but that's mostly subcontracting. Um, and state has to certify you before you can participate. And uh, another program is called Small Business Reserve. Now, this is an interesting program because this is a truly a set aside, just like SBA 8A program. And we have a 15% set aside goal. And any small businesses, if you qualify this small standard and criteria, you can go to the website called uh, Email and Marketplace Advantage, self register and self certify. And what, so why would you want to do that? Number one, it's fo it focuses on you being the small businesses becoming the prime contract. You want to become a prime contractor because you want to be paid, okay, right? So that's an important part, number one. And number two is we have designated all contracts from 50000 to 500000 okay? If the contract falls within that category or range, they must be set aside and designated to small businesses. If it's not, it will require my consent and waiver, okay? So it's a program that's growing very quickly. So last year, we did close to half a billion dollars. 
Um, and I think it's going to be a over billion dollar program within a few years. Very popular program called Small Business Reserve. So to me, those are the important programs that one ought to engage in, okay, to understand the government contracting maze. If there are small opportunities, go for it, okay? You can't not to swim unless you jump in the water, right? <laughs> awesome. I think those are very important. We we certainly learned that, you know, these programs are set aside programs for us. We also talked about, you know, acronyms at the beginning of this program. MBE, we talked about SBR, we're now talking about 8A. These are all terms that our businesses really, really need to understand what they mean and, and, and that these programs are for us, made for us, and set aside for us. Um, we talked a little bit about how, you know, um, companies can really um, be included as subcontractors. So we did talk a little bit about that. Thank you, Secretary Ree. We also wanted to understand what are the top business industry sectors that typically benefit? There's often this misnomer that it's only construction or, or large equipment type companies, but please share a little light on that, anyone from the panel. Sure, I can chime in. Um, just overall government contracting and not just seeing what's, what, what's being procured in the 8A, and it is true construction. We don't have a lot of construction companies because there's so many different elements and parts to construction. It's sometimes hard for a small business to do all that work. That's why the regulation says that they don't have to do the 51% all by themselves. They only have to do 15 when it comes to that. Um, IT, everybody knows anything about technology these days. Um, I, I thought cybersecurity, um, I don't know too much about it was it. It's probably of something else is it right now. Um, the third one I would say is administrative and management, which is the North American industry next code that it's 541611. And that is coaching from anything that has to do from um, coaching, mentoring, providing counseling, and anything as far as IT, construction, or whatever it is. You're a teacher, you can do administrative and management work. So those are the top three that we have seen so far right now in government that are, are where the dollars are coming in, specifically for the 8A program. I would also like to add, besides the construction and IT, which everybody wants to be, you know, uh, uh, wants to engage in, there are other areas that the uh, minority businesses ought to look at, okay? And these are from, uh, sectors that are maybe not directly related to government, but there's a government connection, right? Such as casinos, right? They are approved by the government, the state to do business in the state. So they are subject to certain diversity uh, supplier rules that we have. So doing business with casinos. Number two, uh, we have approved the offshore wind program. That's $2.1 billion project in Maryland outside of Ocean City. And one third of that are supposed to go to the small businesses. So there are work to do in that sector. So there are other areas outside of your typical government pipeline that everybody wants to look at, right? And mostly they're construction or IT, okay? But there are other areas people ought to look at. Good, very good. Well, I think we're, we're, um, we're coming up on time. Um, for our discussion today. I do believe that in the panel um, chat has been some resources. I know that um, we have some resources for Secretary Ree that has been um, outlined for additional follow-up for our panelists to use as, as resources. And I certainly encourage our panelists to do their homework, to lean on their local chambers, and to not be fearful that you know there can be an opportunity for non-traditional types of businesses. I'm hearing consulting, I'm hearing some teaching, I'm hearing some IT, a lot of emerging um, you know, opportunities for non-construction businesses. So I, I certainly um, wish you know, I, I wish you much success in pursuing uh, contracts and capital. I want to say thank you to our gracious panelists for disseminating your wealth of wisdom and knowledge and, and your time. 
Um, I want to share an enormous thank you to the U.S. Black Chamber of Commerce for uh, providing this platform and these resources to our businesses as we grow to seize opportunities into the future. And certainly uh, from here in Madison, Wisconsin, for allowing the Madison Black Chamber of Commerce to share in this discussion today. It has truly been an honor and a privilege getting to know each and every one of you. I wish you um, much safe travels and certainly all the blessings in your businesses and your aspirations to grow your business. With that, I will turn it over to our uh, gracious host, Miss Tiffany, and uh, she can take us in and close us out from here. Thank you. Thank you uh, to each and every one of you, our listeners, our panelists, our uh, moderator for attending part three of our contracts and capital series. Each session of contracts and capital was possible through our work with the SBA Community Navigator Program funded in part through a grant with the U.S. Small Business Administration. A tremendous thank you to our moderator, Ms. Camille Carter of the Madison Black Chamber of Commerce, our guest speakers, Ms. Alicia Gay, Program Manager of BuyBlack.us and CEO of the Startup Shop, LLC. Thank you, Ms. Ernestine Nettles, Assistant Contract Compliance Officer and Business Certification Specialist. Thank you, Ms. Sharon Barrett, 8A Certification Specialist with the U.S. Small Business Administration, and Special Secretary Jimmy Ree of Maryland Governor's Office of Small, Minority, and Women Business Affairs for disseminating their expertise. Our Community Navigator Chambers for advocating for Black businesses, and to you, our viewers, for sharing in the discussion. USBC introduced by Black the only Black certification program with a business directory providing businesses that certify access to private and public procurement opportunities, highlights, and other benefits. This online program can help prepare you for the contracting space as a documents preparation guide certified today by visiting usblackchambers.org slash certification. Join us for future events such as August 4th at 1130 East Coast Time Supplier Diversity Conversations. August 16th at 1130 East Coast Time, How to Protect Your Growing Digital Presence. August 30th, 1130 East Coast Time, Discover Ways to Improve Contracting Success with the Procurement Technical Assistance Center, otherwise known as PTAC. And finally, moving into September, September 13th at 1130 East Coast time, now's the time to finance with community lenders. For more events like this, regularly visit and certify for upcoming events at usblackchambers.org slash webinars. Follow us on social media at usblackchambers.org. If today's forum promoted additional questions and interests, feel free to contact us at any time at programs at usblackchambers.org. We thank you.